Oh, hello. This is Tom from anti-proton.com and today I would like to do a tip of the hat. A, um, a tribute to Mr. Wizard. Mr. Wizard, in the little tiny short period of time that each episode was on TV, for the infinitely long period of time that the TV show was on the air, touched and changed many of us. Uh, got a lot of us interested in science. Mr. Wizard did a famous, uh, famous episode where he showed a scintillator, a gamma scintillator. Kind of like the one I, I have right here. And I just, I just love that episode. It's one of my favorites ever. I think I've watched it like 50 billion times, which makes me a nerd. But he takes a scintillator and he puts each one of the little samples in front of it. And he talks about how they work and everything like that. And so let me do the honor of attempting to show you how a scintillator works as well. Some of you who've seen the video might recognize the way my video flows. It's pretty much dead on for how he did it. Although I could never come close to how good of a job Mr. Wizard did because, well, <laughs> I'm not cool enough. I could never be cool enough to be Mr. Wizard. That's, that's not possible for any human being except perhaps Chuck Norris. But anyway... Scintillation counters, like mine, work on the premise that energy may be counted in discrete quantities and then summed to create a fingerprint of what is or is not there. That seems maybe a little bit complicated. Let me make it a little bit more simple. Picture a graph, like this one right here. Each one of these little people is selling boxes of cookies. That's pretty simple, right? One box. Five boxes, ten, fifteen boxes, twenty, twenty-five boxes of cookies. Sally, Mary, Fred, John, Tom, and Bob. Each one of these people represents a distinct channel, if you will, a distinct range across our little 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 diagram here. They're the x-axes. Now let us say that Mary sells a box of cookies. Now let's say that Tom sells a box of cookies. Now let's say that John, now Tom, Bob, Tom, John, Sally, John, Tom, Tom, Mary. As we start to build up here, as people start buying boxes of cookies, very quickly you start to notice a pattern. For the first couple boxes, it's very hard at the very bottom, and there are only a couple boxes have been sold. It's hard to tell who's doing what. But as people start buying more and more boxes, yeah. as people start buying more and more boxes, you can quickly start seeing. A pattern. Now, so you're saying what do cookie boxes have to do with a scintillator? I'll tell you. Imagine for a minute that each one of these little people here controlled a certain amount of energy. When the scintillator hit, was hit by a certain amount of energy, these people would check and if one of them saw that their energy level, their little range, was the range that got hit, they would make a dot. Make another dot, another dot, another dot, another dot. And these would be, instead of boxes of cookies, counts. One to 100 kilo electron volts. Two to 100 kilo electron volts. Uh, uh, well, sorry, one to 100, 101 to 200, 201 to 300, and so on. Each one of these people is 100 kilo electron volts. A kilo electron volt being the unit of energy that we measure. We could tell right off the bat that uh, 500 right around here kilo electron volts got the most energy. And then we can look up and see what type of element produces a gamma ray most commonly at that energy. And then we could detect it and know exactly what it was. But beyond detecting it, we could measure it, something you can do with a scintillator. That's the idea. So when you look at a scintillation graph, what you're seeing
Now I'll show you this in just a couple of minutes. If you sing energy expressed in kilo electron volts, those are thousands of electron volts, that's just the unit that we use, versus counts. So as the little gammas start to appear, and they start to uh, enter at the bottom, there's little, little channels down here, certain areas are going to get more than others, and they're going to produce peaks that we'll be able to detect. Simple as that. Let's go look at some right now and see what they look like. Come with me. Before you is a scintillation counter. This is a sodium iodide thallium activated scintillation counter. Scintillation is Latin for flashing. What a scintillation counter does is very simple. Whenever radiation strikes the scintillation counter, specifically gamma or x-ray radiation, the scintillator registers a pulse of electricity telling the detector, which is attached to the scintillator, that gamma radiation was detected. But there's more that it can do, and there's a little bit more complexity to Let how Let us works. pull the scintillation detector itself out of the lead. Now, if you're curious, the reason that the scintillation detector is contained inside of lead, and encased if you will, is so that the, the object that's being placed inside of the chamber, which is right here, will be virtually the only radiation that strikes the detector. Otherwise, the detector is so sensitive that it will detect other things as well. We will remove the lead that is in the back, and we will move the camera over and focus it down towards here, where the actual detector itself resides. This is the scintillation detector. This particular one is a Radiation Sensors LLC model 6S6P 1.5 VDC2. It has a 38 millimeter scintillation, uh, 38 millimeter sodium iodide crystal that is thallium doped. This is the high voltage input right here. And this is the data coming out right here, the pulses. For many years, radiation was detected primarily using a Geiger counter. A Geiger de de detector here with a Geiger-Muller tube on the end. For every single piece of radiation that hits this little detector that it's capable of detecting, a cascade of electrons is generated, completing a circuit. The pulse of energy is then registered on the counter. The drawback to this device, besides its inefficiency at detecting gammas, meaning that many gamma particles or many gamma waves can move straight through the detector without actually being picked up, with only a very small fraction actually being seen, is that for each successful detection there is one and only one count. Any energy that it attempts to show you, such as this reading of miller rankins per hour, which is an, uh, an, an explanation of how much energy is being conveyed to you, they're only approximations. They are not very accurate. Because this device does not actually know the true amount of energy that strikes this. Only what that energy would be if it was exactly what this was calibrated with. Now on to the scintillator. The scintillator is an incredibly beneficial addition to the laboratory. Scintillation counters, like the one that you see before you, right here, are capable of detecting energy as well as counts. The one you see before you is a pretty classic sodium iodide detector. If you're wondering the reason that there's lead all over the place and surrounding the detector or when it's inserted surrounding the detector is because all background radiation must be blocked to make sure that what this sees is as much of the sample as possible and as little as anything else of anything else as possible. Let me put this detector where we can look at it for a moment. And let me put the camera on it and explain how it works. In the back, power comes in, high voltage. And on the other side of the back, a signal, a pulse leaves. Now, 
in the front here is a sodium iodide crystal. It has been doped with thallium. This, cre this crystal reacts in a very peculiar way when gamma or x-ray radiation strikes it. When a high energy photon, such as gamma or an x-ray, strikes this crystal, it produces a flash of ultraviolet light. The Latin word for flash is scintillate. Or rather, that's what it means in Latin. And such, scintillator and scintillation, which of course are the words that describe what this is and what it does. This burst, this pulse, if you will, of ultraviolet light is proportionate to the energy that struck it. Thus, this machine is capable of registering the amount of energy. It is not merely the number of times it was struck. The ultraviolet light immediately hits a photocathode. As the ultraviolet light st strikes the photocathode, the photocathode emits electrons. The pulse of electro electrons that it emits are immediately directed against a a diode. The diode, when struck with electrons, emits even more electrons, a specific number of them. Uh, and the, these electrons move up a chain of more diodes, gaining more and more at discrete levels, more and more electrons, until they strike the very back of the unit where they're picked up by an anode and registered as a pulse which goes to the machine. As a result of this, the scintillation counter is not only incredibly sensitive, but also capable of detecting energy. Now, these devices can be plugged directly to counters like this, in which case they're extremely sensitive, and they can be tuned to specific energies. Or, in the case of mine, and this is a piece of lead shielding that goes in the back, they can be fed into a device like this. Let me show you this, this device in more detail. is a spectrometer. It shows its voltage, positive or negative. It shows the activity that, that's being detected. Each one of these little flashes, were you to see any, would be a count. And it tells you when it's acquiring data. The front is quite simple and straightforward. The back of the scintillation counter is significantly more complex, containing many different devices, many different plugs, for example, this device is capable of connecting to other units to detect things such as muon radiation using a coincidence circuit and other various devices. We will now take the scintillator and load it into the scintillation chamber right here. These are large pieces of lead, thick lead, greater than an inch to prevent background radiation. The scintillator must be very carefully inserted into its housing to ensure that nothing happens to it. It is a very delicate piece of equipment, to say the least. This equipment was form-fitted for the scintillator very, very painstakingly and by hand. Once the scintillation device has been set and is ready to go, let's put the protection on the back that guards the back. There is even a top piece right here. The top piece is made of blocks of lead supported by oak. Each one of these ingots, ingots is 3 inches long by 0 0.75 inches tall by about an inch in width. This unit is now ready to detect samples. Let's see For our first find. sample, we will introduce radium. This pocket watch contains radium-226. What do you suppose it will look like under the scintillation detector? Let us lower the pocket watch into place. Now we can probably suspend this pocket watch.
blocking almost all background radiation, including the radiation that comes down from space. What do you suppose the radium-226 will look like? Let us now start. We are now acquiring the gammas are flying from the compass and they are striking the sodium iodide crystal. The sodium iodide crystal is producing ultraviolet light. These flashes are being detected by the photocathode and the electrons that are freed from that uh, detection are striking diodes. The diodes are bouncing those electrons up the photomultiplier tube where they arrive at an anode which collects the readings. As you can see, the energies are building up very specifically, like a fingerprint. Let's now see what some of those energies look like. As you can see, each one of these energies is expressed in kilo electron volts. Now, radium produces many different decay products. These are elements that come from radium as it decays slowly. Let's load the most common ones into our library and then look at them. The two most common gamma emitting elements are lead 214 and bismuth 214. As you can see, we're pretty close on our, our calculations, maybe just to touch off. Please keep in mind the sodium iodide detector, such as this one, can be off by a few kilo electron volts, but as you can see, the signature is hard to ignore. Given time, this might match as well. From another view, everything is a little bit a little bit more easily seen. Again, bismuth 214, lead 214, lead 214. I believe we can safely say that radium 226 should be in here. Let's check. There it is, right on the dot, radium-226. This is the result of x-rays produced from the uh, Bromstrahlung effect, which are powerful, powerful particles, like beta, for example, which are striking the lead, and as they slow down, they emit a gamma or an x-ray. That's what produces this. That's an anomaly and should be disregarded. Let's move on and try a different element. Now let's try a different element. We will try a piece of uranium. Here is a piece of natural uranium. When we place the uranium in the device right here, we can then put the top on. We must be careful because lead is heavy and the system could be easily damaged if we were to drop the lead. The lead again shields against background noise. Right. Now let's see what we can get. From now this let's one. see what natural uranium looks like. As you can see, those gamma rays are immediately striking the crystal. Now a lot, of the, 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 a lot of the little speckles you see at the bottom are created by gammas that are produced as a result of interference. As the pure gammas fly through the tube, they strike the metal and sometimes this can change them somewhat. They, they, can, they can actually change their energy, they can produce secondary ionization, many other effects that produce different energies. The higher energy of the sample that we test the more of this garbage we're going to get at the bottom. But as you can see, given a few moments, this sample will clean itself up. Do you notice something interesting about the natural uranium? Look carefully. Do you see it? Here, let me help. Turning on the exact same isotope finder that we saw before, observe. Lead 214, Lead 214, bismuth 214, radium 226, that anomaly, 
and several other things are all present once more. Why do you think that is? The answer is because the natural uranium decay series contains radium-226. Uranium-238 turns into thorium-234 and then into uh, protactinum-234m, then uranium-234 as well. The result of this is thorium-230, then radium-226, what we looked at a moment ago. Finally, you end up with radon-222, Palladium-218, Lead-214, as you see right here, Bismuth-214, Polonium-214, Lead-210, Bismuth-210, Polonium-210, and then finally, Stable Lead. So as you can, as you can uh, plainly see, wherever you have natural uranium, you will naturally have radium. Let's test a different sample and see what we get. Let's try a sample of americium-241. This is an element that exists inside of smoke alarms. Every smoke alarm that uses an ionization chamber like this one, which is a lot of smoke alarms, uses this technology. Almost always americium-241 is used. It's primarily an alpha emitter, but it does produce gamma. Let's see what it produces. We put the smoke alarm inside of the chamber. We cover it to keep all the bad stuff out, things that don't need to be in there. All right. yeah, that's not going to fit down too well. And now let's see uh, what we can see. Here is the spectrum for americium-241. As you can see, it quite quickly climbs. Americium-241 normally produces a powerful gamma, well, excuse me, a low energy gamma ray at approximately 59.94 kiloelectron volts, which is pretty close to where we are right here. My calibration is just a touch off. It's off by 3 kiloelectron volts, which is a very, very tiny little amount. This little mark right here represents what the actual number should be. It produces a secondary gamma at 26.34 kiloelectron volts. Again, we're off by just a few, which is quite normal for a detector like this. The final gamma that it produces of its most common gammas is 13.9 kiloelectron volts. Let's see if we can pick that up. It's somewhere right around here. It's very difficult to pick up low energy uh, gamma emissions, especially that low which is unfortunate because there are so many wonderful gamma emissions that occur at 13 kiloelectron volts. It's sort of a magic number. And here we go. From our smoke alarm, in a mere 85 seconds, we have detected 2200 counts, much more sensitive than a Geiger counter. But just out of curiosity, what would happen if we put another alpha emitter in front of this device. One that is not normally known for gamma. Let's try that. I have very carefully placed a sample of polonium-210 inside of this chamber. Very carefully. Polonium-210 is an alpha producer, primarily, although it actually does produce a very small amount of gammas. Let's see if these gammas pick up, and let's also see what the alphas do when they strike the metal. This should be interesting. And now for polonium-210. We accumulate. What will we get? Well, polonium-210 is an alpha producer, so we should not directly produce or detect any of the alphas. There is a gamma particle that is emitted, but I'm not seeing much of anything. It could be that the gamma particle emitted is outside of our current range, which is from approximately 9 kiloelectron volts 
all the way up to about 800, uh, about 687 kilo electron volts. If we switch to the other view that shows a little bit more information, you can see that there are little speckles appearing here and there. These are mostly background radiation speckles, although a few of them are caused by X-rays, which are the results of the uh, of the rapidly slowing down X, uh, alpha particles. As you can see, this is not an effective source when detecting alpha radiation. Let's see what else we can detect. How about beta radiation? We will now add strontium-90, which is a powerful and potent beta emitter. Strontium-90 does produce a gamma by means of yttrium-90. This is a secondary effect. It's not a primary effect by any means. Because of the potency of strontium-90, it is important not to touch it, if at all possible. Let's see what we get. Strontium-90 and yttrium-90 together form a very potent beta radiation emitting pair. They do emit a gamma. So between the Bronsterlung effect of the beta striking the outside of the scintillator and causing secondary gammas and x-rays, and the actual primary gamma that comes from yttrium-90, perhaps we'll see something, but I don't believe very much. Let's see. As you can see, Let's move over here to the other view. There's a significantly larger amount of, of activity going on. The reason that this is occurring is because the beta, the particles that are flying out of the strontium-90, are smashing into the metal and causing x-rays to go off all over the place. Obviously, this beta emitter is quite potent. It's very difficult to get a good read on a beta emitter as a result of this. And the energies that you see right here, they're incoherent. And they will be incoherent. The only hope we could get would be to block the beta emissions by wrapping this in thick aluminum. Let's try a very classic sample. Something that we know will show up really well. Let's try cesium-137. That's a fallout product from nuclear accidents. It also emits a powerful gamma ray and, of course, beta radiation. Alrighty, let's let out our cesium-137 out of the piece of lead that we keep it in. Obviously, it's pretty potent. And we will place it in the scintillator. Oops. Having a little trouble picking it up. Alright, now let's see what that looks like in the scintillator. Alright, cesium 137. Let's see what it looks like. Powerful beta, powerful gamma emitter. Look at that build. As you can see, cesium-137 produces a signature like this. A massive photo peak is produced at 661.66 kiloelectron volts. This one is just a little bit off, but that's all right. Oops. 661. 661 is right here. It's a little bit past that. And another one at 32, 32.19, which is just a little hair over from here. Let's switch to the other view. Oopsie. There. Put into perspective, you can see nice, beautiful peak. This, in this case, is a gamma ray. And this is also a gamma ray. Well, it's not a gamma ray, it's a collection of them. That 
is cesium-137. And with 3,700 disintegrations per second in my sample, not very much of it is needed, not very much time to get a good picture. We can smooth this picture out a little. As you see, nice beautiful cesium-137 photo peak all set to go.